not about to make any speeches at this stage, to, which will relieve many of you. Um, it just uh, suffice to introduce um, uh, my, fellow, uh, my fellows on the panel. Uh, I think the best way to do this is let them each have their, have their say, 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes perhaps, um, if they can last that long. If there are burning issues from the floor, then fine, jump up. If there are not, then we will we'll get into a, a freer discussion at the end of them expressing their views. Unless, of course, they say something outrageous, in which case I reserve the right to interject. Um, Jamal? Um, Jamal is the chairman of Schlumberge Group um, uh, for Asia Pacific. He's been with, uh, been with them for 28 um, uh, years all over the world um, and has held various positions in marketing and, um, uh, and management. Um, he worked in London for them um, in 2004 um, and um, in recent years has been, um, uh, has been here since uh, August 2009, Vice President for Global Accounts Asia 2010 appointed as the chairman of Schlumberger for Asia Pacific. Um, if you don't mind, I'll keep them short, yeah? Okay. Um, Reza? Dada Reza um, is CEO of Bank Muamalat, um, was appointed in, um, in 2008, uh, had a career with, um, uh, with Touche Ross in, um, uh, in London, and later joined Arab Malaysian Corporation as an internal auditor and progressed to become uh, the corporate finance uh, manager. He has served with, um, uh, with Kazana and uh, with Silterra. Um, and uh, from 2002 to 2005 was the acting CEO of, um, of Tradewinds. Um, for the three years um, after that, Dada Reza served at DRB Highcom before joining Bank Wamalat. Okay, I believe that our other panelist has been introduced already, so I will not take any further time on that. Um, Dato, would you like to begin? Yep. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, welcome. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer uh, for inviting me uh, today and uh, also uh, uh, Mr. David Berry for your kind words. Um, Actually, um, if you ask me about my experience in, as an independent director, I have sat in probably over 70 or 80 companies throughout my uh, tenorship uh, working. I have never been an independent director. So, uh, but what I, what I would like to do today is give you a perspective of what management or CEO thinks about an independent director, how they should behave, and um, perhaps what we see in terms of value add uh, you have for an independent director. So uh, let me start by, by, by talking a little bit about uh, what has happened uh, recently. Basically, uh, there is a transformation uh, in terms of uh, the role of independent directors. Uh, now, it is no longer a standard business practice uh, to be an independent director, but, but the, the, the bar is a lot higher now. Um, what we see today is gone are the days of uh, circular resolutions where you know, we try and push things and we say, hey boss, you know, sign this off. Uh, the, the directors are now a lot more concerned when they see something, oh, this is a procurement process which, which, uh, which is 20 million ringgit and is material, we can't do this via circular resolution. Let's do it via meeting. And, and, and these are the things that are happening now in, in the sense that we see better and good corporate governance coming in because directors are playing their role uh, from just merely being numbers to, to one that, that is able to differentiate uh, between something that is important and not. Um, the role is becoming also more challenging um, 
And uh, I guess uh, there's a lot of you who are bank directors here or financial institution directors here. Uh, before you can even be a director, there's processes like the fit and proper processes which need to go through. And, and, and uh, regulatory requirements are, are great. Uh, the first people that they will call up if things go wrong, uh, the central bank is going to call the independent directors. And, and also, um, I guess what's important is also the fact that it's not about making money anymore, um, being a director. It's also fulfilling your other responsibilities like um, um, ethical and leadership values uh, that, that you bring to the board. Um, something may be profitable, but if it's destroying the community or the environment, is it something that you approve? Uh, you know, management will want to push all these things through, but as an independent director, you need to think out these processes because uh, it's no longer about money. It's doing business in a very responsible way. And, and most of all, you are called upon is when things become related party. You stand on your two feet and you have to play the role of the board in, in becoming an independent director and looking at the transactions. Now, suffice me to say that uh, with all the problems that have come across and uh, the WorldCom, the LIBOR and all these problems that have come across, the people that have come to uh, the scrutiny are the independent directors. People are looking at independent directors in terms of what role did you play uh, in terms of preventing uh, these items from happening. And, and you would notice, and I think Rita may come uh, afterwards, is, is, is at EGMs as well, people start questioning uh, the independent directors. Now, how did you approve the bonus of, this, of the CEO or the group MD and, and why was he paid millions of ringgit uh, and what processes did you do and how did you determine his KPI? At the end of the day, the, the, the groups like the minority watchdog are going to question the independent directors on issues like this. Now, in terms of expectation as well, um, what does it take to be an independent director? Basically, it's, it's the three C's, uh, the commitment, the competency and the characteristics. Uh, what is important, I guess, is your ability to know whether you're, you're fully briefed or not uh, in a board meeting. Uh, management is going to put the papers that they want you to put. But you must have the ability to say what is not there that I need to ask in order for me to have a full view of the whole proceedings. Um, you have to ask the right question. You've got to spot the missing agenda. And basically, typical things that you would expect in a meeting is you need to look at whether there is a progress report, there is a financial report, and there is a, a risk and compliance report as well that comes uh, as part of your agenda in, 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 in managing a company. Now, in terms of commitment, uh, if I can share with you some of these statistics which have come from Pricewaterhouse, the blue tells you about the uh, banking environment uh, and uh, the green is uh, the, the other banks and uh, the orange is uh, the insurance companies. This uh, statistics actually is very interesting in the sense that independent directors are spending more than 110 days uh, or about 44% of their workday in a financial institution. So if you think this is part-time work, no, this is not part-time work. This is half-time work. And, and you can see across that uh, the time demanded from all, 
all these independent directors is quite significant. And if you were in a financial institution, you've got uh, the board meeting, the audit meeting, the uh, risk management meeting, and then you may be involved in the credit committee meetings. Um, and, and so the time spent preparing and attending these meetings is, is quite taxing and cumbersome. Another important thing that, that I probably said already is, is, is you need to understand the business and what surrounds the business. Uh, the key questions that most independent directors or most directors don't ask are these questions. What is our strategy? Are we on the right strategy? Which are the customers do we serve and what products do we, should we offer? I, I, I find that throughout my tenure working as a, as a management team, uh, not many directors ask this question. Um, a, one of the best examples of directors who ask these type of questions are, uh, is, is my former chairman, uh, Tan Sri Magat. Uh, he's very good at that. And um, I, I guess uh, apart from committing or looking at the smaller things, these are the bigger things that you should be asking because that determines the, the direction and the vision of the company moving forward and whether uh, the company has got a future in the marketplace. Now, in terms of competencies, if one were to analyze again the Price Waterhouse report, uh, what is also interesting is, is that what are the traits that a director should have? And they ask this question to all the directors. And basically what comes out of this survey is risk management and strategic planning are the key areas where 70 and 68% says they need these as part of their trade. So this is what you need as an independent director uh, in terms of uh, looking at the organization. Um, another key area, especially in financial institution, is the area of technology. I think we take technology for granted, but there are a lot of things uh, in technology that um, that we can be hoodwinked on. Something that is 100,000 can be packaged to be 1 million or 10 million. You don't know that. And you've got to find ways to know that. And, and, and the only way to do that is by getting some technical expertise, by talking around with people who know the subject matter and say, is this reasonable or not reasonable? And, um, you've got to check that independently of, of management and, uh, and of uh, the process that exists. So technology is another key area where you can see a lot of abuses that goes on. And, and vendors are very fond, especially in financial institutions. If a server costs uh, half a million ringgit in a normal PLC, it will cost one and a half million ringgit to a bank because they think that banks have got big pockets and they will charge you a lot of money for that. So, another thing that why uh, I, we just, in terms of characteristics here, I just like to share with you, why do directors join a board? We think that it is because of money. The answer is no. Actually, Directors join, and independent directors join the board because they have been asked by the shareholders. So 85% of respondents said that they were asked by shareholders. And then about 38% to 4, uh, said because of skill development. But remuneration goes right down. It's actually 17%. So actually, uh, you're doing a job because you want to do a job, not because uh, you want to be paid for a job. That, that survey is very clear on, on, on that matter. Um, what are the challenges that the uh, independent directors face? Uh, basically, um, the 
type of independent directors that we get nowadays are mainly ex-government officials, lawyers, accountants. These are the typical people that, that are independent directors. Perhaps we should look at um, other areas as well, people with expertise in sales and marketing, people with expertise on the technology side. Uh, these are good people who can be also independent directors, but somehow or other they are not part of the equation. Uh, in terms of getting qualified candidates to choose from, there are not many uh, areas. There are some institutes, uh, especially the Institute of Chartered Accountants. They do provide a list of people, but um, they're not extensive. So uh, it's not easy to get a menu of people you want to choose. Uh, the other thing is, is remuneration against liability. I guess uh, for what you're doing and the risk that you're taking, um, is your remuneration appropriate? Um, most of the times, especially in financial institutions, uh, with the risk of being called up and, and, and the questions that you're being asked, I would say that for what you're paid, uh, it's peanuts. Um, also, the state of mind. Um, are you going to be a yes man because you want to tag along and, and, and follow what management wants because uh, the next time out, you know, your, your appointment will be, will be subject to scrutiny. I think that's, that's something that you need to be uh, looking at. But I think from day to day, we see improvements in that. Where people out of principle may resign from a board because they're not agreeable to things. Training uh, in terms of enhancing the effectiveness, yes, uh, training is good, but, but it, it doesn't guarantee you being a good director. Uh, there's a lot of this training that's going on, but uh, the important thing is, is being market savvy. And, uh, and, and one of the most important things is, is, is relating yourself to, to, to management. Um, one thing I notice is, is there, there are two groups of, of, of directors that exist. One which um, sits above the law and says, I am a director. I am superior to management. Those are the people we don't like. Uh, and because you, you, you sit and we will give you as little information as possible because we don't like you. So what you need to do actually is to relate yourself to management. Understand from management what their problems are, what their concerns are, and work together with them. And um, with that, you have a very conducive board. But if you are going to sit above that and, and say, you know, hey, where's my te tarik? Why are you serving me coffee today? You know, those are the things we don't like. Uh, so you could always say things in a nice way. And, and when you get cooperation from the management, I guess a lot of things get a lot smoother. And, and you have a, a very harmonious uh, relationship uh, in discharging your duties. Tenor limit, this is, this is something that uh, a lot of people are beginning to talk. They say that an independent director is no longer independent if he serves for more than five years. I think that will be a reality uh, with new regulations that are going to come. Uh, evaluation and performance appraisals, well, that happens in, in, in financial institutions. Directors are supposed to write and think about what another director and how they do. I, I guess we don't like that process, but we have to do that as well. Um, but um, I, I don't think the performance appraisals are a good thing. You are fairly mature people. I don't think you need to be, to be appraised. So in, in summary, uh, basically it is important for independent directors to embrace the concept of ethical leadership. I think uh, it's, it's no longer a profit game uh, in terms of being a director. It's about a responsibility that you have to discharge to society. And, and, and these are the important things. And um, basically, uh, the sustainability of the organization is what you need to do. And integrity and accountability, you, you are the guardians of this. When things go wrong, this is what happens. And, and being uh, close to management, 
I guess you will get a lot more in terms of integrity and accountability. And the most important thing is, is, is making a decision that is against uh, what is being proposed. That is okay, actually, as long as it is rationally put out. And uh, I guess uh, one or two days, the management will sulk over the matter, but we will get on with it. We will do things and, 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 and basically uh, uh, abide by the decision. But um, the important thing is, is being there and, and doing things uh, right and, and getting things uh, in order. So with that, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I, I, at the risk of getting uh, beaten up by the executive, perhaps we should get Jamal to have a crack, and then the others who are slightly more independent can have a go. Let us have your view of what a, an independent director is like, Jamal. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm not. Uh, I'm not prepared, have not prepared a presentation for this session. And I think, Datuk, uh, you've covered everything that, you know, had ever crossed my mind about independent directors. And I think if I can assume that everybody in the room is clear in their mind what an independent director is, both, you know, in terms of uh, corporate requirement or, or regulatory uh, requirement, as well as uh, self-personal or shareholder moral obligation, then I would say that uh, the, you know, some of the issues surrounding selecting uh, an independent director should be very, very straightforward, right? For example, if you want an, uh, an independent director who's going to be effective and truly independent, other than the issue of remuneration, which is, which is uh, another story altogether, uh, is the fact that perhaps that person has to have exhibited um, a good skill in communication, in communication, in being able to communicate disagreement, uh, good skills in persuading. Uh, we, we had discussion at lunch uh, with the people that I was at the table with, where uh, these are some of the skills that may have to uh, be developed over time. Um, on top of that, the other point that Dato mentioned, which I want to pick up on, is the 360-degree evaluation. I mean, if an independent director is subjected to, to such a process, what you've turned the board of directors into is a, is a popularity contest. And you're never going to be popular when you're always questioning, you're always challenging, and, and you're always uh, vigilant that you're going to have to say no at some point or you, should, you know, express your disagreement. I think that um, you're right, uh, you know, executives, some executive members of the board uh, that I've been on in the past are, are extremely powerful people. Uh, but what I find interesting is in situations where there is a tense, uh, dysfunctional, if you like, of a board, normally a senior independent director is the key because I find he or she plays the ultimate role in, in, in moving things along and, and improving matters. That's, I think, is... Uh, about the only thing I can add to your presentation for now, uh, unless you have other questions that you want to ask me. Uh, you like to add? Uh, a very important uh, point with Dato Reja has raised, uh, I would like to just add to it. Uh, he has communicated about 3C, and I would change it because it is I have experienced, you know. Competency is one thing. Compelling, that is persistence, must be a trait of the person. If you are not persistent, then what happens when you raise the question during board meeting? They will give you A, B, C, D answer. I'm not saying everybody has that problem, but sometimes you may be given an answer which is not satisfactory or they will try to beat the bush around. Now, if you are, or they will say, okay, uh, Dato, uh, we are going to send uh, some documents to you. Uh, let us move to the second agenda. And in the light of uh, the second agenda or the third discussion, uh, we lose sight of that first discussion. And then the problem may not be totally resolved or the answer is not satisfactorily given to you. So 
if you are persistent, then you will again come back, okay, now let us get, go back to that particular agenda on which I had uh, requested some clarification. So this document is not enough, so can we keep it on hold? Now, they give you some document to satisfy you again, say after one week or so, and uh, still you are not satisfied. Or if you have the, they have given the question, you have more questions on those answers. So you raise those questions. That what truly is investigative mind is? How we, we do not use any extraordinary skill. With the answer which is provided to us, we try to evaluate the validity of the answer. We try to evaluate to which extent I can buy this and to which extent it, log it appears logical and it goes uh, li in line with the things which are known to me. If it is not there, then don't simply try to get, um, I can say, convinced because somebody has tried to convince you. So keep on persisting. And then, and the third is complete understanding. That is the third C. Complete understanding of the matter. As I just mentioned earlier also, if you are not fully aware about the business, about that particular venture or about that particular uh, decision which, rela which is related to number of issues, then you will most likely be played out because you have not understood it. You have not, you can't see the various dimensions of that problem. And sometimes when you are not fully aware, then you feel a bit nervous or a bit shy also to raise questions. Whatever answer they give, you will say, oh, yeah, okay, okay, I understand, I understand. Means this is a very blunt uh, answer I'm giving to you because this I have faced with number of directors. They have not understood it, but they said, okay, yeah, I understand, yeah, it's okay, okay, okay. I know one gentleman, without mentioning his name, he is from a very illustrious uh, post from the government department. He joined one company and I know he has consented to a particular re resolution. He is a uh, director in a public listed company. That resolution does not make any sense to me as an investigator, I must tell you. But still, these four directors have given consent. I talked to them at least with this gentleman. He said, Kumar. I to crack it. I couldn't understand that. He tried to understand and I don't want to expose myself to tell them that I am not, uh, I'm very weak in this area. So they tried to explain it. So I thought it should be okay. When Dato is saying it must be okay, it should be okay. And then so that's how I gave the consent. Now, this is the true problem we are facing. Better accept it. Once we accept it, then we will try to educate ourselves in that particular industry, but that particular business. And it will help us to, that is why I feel um, the three things, the three core issues associated with independent directors is understanding of the business or the level and the level of risk it is currently having, background check of the company who has offered you to become the director. How many of us normally do this? We do the background check for employees. Have, have we ever done the background check for that gentleman who has been introduced to me through my friend, very old friend of 20 years? That is not the criteria. Look from where he has reached to this level, what was his background, his education. Do some search on company's registrar. Do some search on lot of sites. I, can't, I don't want to reveal those because we do that exercise. <laughs> and third is level of transparency. What is the level of transparency? Being a human, you know better when some explanation is given to you. When you see the operation of the company, you sense the level of transparency this company is having. If the level of transparency is low, you must decide and determine whether it is good for you to continue with this company or not. If every time you have some suspicions remain about the explanation which was asked by you, it is high time for you to evaluate whether it is worth accepting the fee or not. That's all. I, I did want to pick up something you said, um, uh, Dato. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Can we have a show of hands? How many, uh, how many um, former civil servants are here in the room? How many former civil servants? Stick your hand right up. Be, don't, don't be embarrassed about it. How many accountants? Four. Okay. How many lawyers? 
Okay. All right. Now, how many directors? How many directors are here in the room? Yeah, directors. This includes all the people that have previously put their hands up, I hope. Okay. Okay, there are a lot of people here from management, and I suggest the secretarial side as well. Okay. It's very interesting. I'm concerned about the look-alike boards of directors, and if we're, all, if we're all sort of gray shadows of each other, independence is very difficult to, um, uh, to achieve. We tend to, we tend to go along with the crowd. We, uh, we're all taught that the board should be a nice collegiate environment. It shouldn't be disruptive. Um, there's a problem with that. What happens when you get the board papers the night before the board meeting? Oh, sorry, La, but we had some urgent things that we had to get in, so we held them back. We thought you'd want them all in one. And you take them home in your bag, and you sit down after supper at 8 o'clock, and you try to go through them. There's one that you don't understand, so you put it on one side. Then you have your coffee, and you go back to it, and it's approaching midnight, and you read it again. And it can't make head or tail of this, but never mind. Kumar will be sitting next to me and he's always on top of things like that and if he doesn't do it then Jamal will raise an issue because he's got 101 questions I'll just sit there and wing it and it comes to the following morning and this item comes up on the agenda Kumar isn't saying a word Jamal isn't saying a word what the hell do you do now this is when your courage as an independent director is really tested you have to be willing to say, sorry, La, I don't understand. Because there's a big burning issue here. If you don't understand and they don't understand, why on earth should you approve it? Why on earth should you even discuss it? But you've got to be willing to be intellectually naive. Ask the dumb questions. It's perhaps the most important weapon that, um, uh, uh, that you have. Without it, well, you know, I don't say anything. He doesn't want to say anything. He doesn't want to say anything. Management gets aggressive. It goes through on the nod. Yeah? And if management is really clever, well, they can use this if they want to. I do not want to suggest that management are all scoundrels. Most management are not. But it is capable of using a situation um, uh, like this. So I think questions are important. Dado, you raised something else, and you said five years, and you ceased to be independent. Okay. I, I met um, uh, last week a gentleman who sits on the board of four public companies. He's 85 years old. He's been an independent director of one of these public companies for over 30 years. Okay. And he tells me he's more qualified today to serve as an independent director than the day he was first appointed. And I believe him. Yeah. And we have a problem here with this kind, of mind, uh, th this kind of mindset that we have that somehow the passage of time reduces independence. Independence is not in a watch. In my view, independence is in your heart and in your mind. And if you have the intellectual courage to carry on being independent, why should you be deprived or why should your shareholders be deprived of your ability to be independent simply because on one particular midnight the clock ticked over and you've done your five years, so sorry, La, you're out. I think it's a thoroughly bad argument. And incidentally, it's been changed in the code or the room to change it has been in the code because a test of independence currently at nine years can be run by the, um, uh, uh, can be determined by the shareholders. So if the nominating committee sits and evaluates an independent director and say he still meets all our criteria for um, independence, not just in terms of meeting statutory requirements and a list of rules, but also on a behavior basis, and then they're willing to recommend, as the, all of the rest of the uh, directors, to the shareholders that this man should be re-elected as an independent director, then I think the decision is appropriately with the people who own the company and not with the regulators. So I'm stirring a little bit here, but I'm, I'm very concerned that, uh, that anyone seems to think that independence is, uh, is something that goes with, um, goes with time. Um, you want to have a, an extra say on some of these matters? Uh, the, the one thing I would certainly like to add again, that uh, don't feel hesitant 
Uh, I still remember this. I learned all right when, when I was very young. My father was director in a public bank and one of the independent directors. So he always, he gave a very clear signal to the director, to the MD in the headquarter, that if the board paper does not reach to him at least two weeks prior to the meeting, he will not allow that resolutions or that matter to be discussed in the meeting. How urgent it is, it is your headache. So make sure that urgent matters are, or especially those which involve certain, more than certain amount, or certain, he has some threshold. Till the time that it doesn't come to me on time, I'm not going to, I will, I will either raise my absenteeism from that resolution, or I will say that I don't agree with that because I have not gone through, I have not understood it. Very correctly, Mr. Berry said that if you do not understand the head and tail of that document or of those papers which has been sent to you for your consent, please abstain from that. So that tomorrow you can safeguard yourself. Don't simply say, yes, man, because the MD is too aggressive or MD is too benevolent to you or t taking extra care of you, then you are inviting trouble, my friend. It's a very common problem and I have discussed it number of times in conferences, in seminar. Recently I had a meeting, I told you about 100 over directors were there and face to face they, there was a workshop and I talked to them and I have come to know the type of problem they have faced and they are facing currently. Certainly we are, the, all those who are sitting here are not exception to that situation. So try to first get the paper on time, study it properly. If you need some clarification, if you are doubtful about something or if it is not coming to your mind, don't feel hesitant to raise question. Raising question, it may, be, it may look dumb to others. Who? I'm not bothered about others, I'm only concerned about myself. I must tell you, I'm an accountant and uh, investigator. Lot of things which is not, which is technical, I don't understand. And I bluntly say that I don't understand. Please provide me the assistance with a technical guy who can explain me in layman's language. That's how I continue my work. I, do, I can show, that, oh, I'm an accountant or investigator, jack of all trade, master of zero. So that creates problem. That will create problem to my work, to quality of my work. And I won't be able to do justice to my work. And exactly the same thing I will suggest to all of you, that when you find problem, especially technologies involved with that particular decision or particular resolution, and if you are not very clear, straight away ask some more time, ask them to provide more information, ask them to provide them some technical assistance who can come to the boardroom, explain nicely how things have, are moving, how it, what are the risks associated, do the proper evaluation, and once you are satisfied, yes, go ahead with your consent. Thanks. Any question? Do we have any questions from the floor? Yes, please. By the way, I'm Rosman from Barayat. I have a comment to make. You know, while we have all these rules, regulation, guidelines, you name it, eh? uh, SC, Bursa, Banagara, and all the stuff, yet we still have lots of issues. Uh, it's just like religion. Eh? We have all the religion, but at the end of the day, people still do a lot of things. Uh, the point is this. Until and unless, which I made it earlier this morning, until and unless your selection criteria is right, until you put the fundamentals in place, you will always have these issues about group think, even at the director's level. Forget about management. And the chairman says something, the senior director says something, the rest of the members say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the right thing to do. And when you talk about courage, you know, not many people really, really have the courage. While I understand in terms of survey, remuneration may not be at a higher level, but there's some reality in life too. Because there are people still looking for this. They want to be elected, you know, they want to be popular and stuff like that. So how do we, how do we really raise the bar? Because the role of directors is really taking the organization to the next level. You can only have the organization moving to the next level if you have people who are really competent. If people are really moving above their self-interest. 
they don't think about themselves. They don't think about remuneration. They think about how can I bring this organization higher and higher and higher. So self-interest is a no-no if you want to become a director. But the question is how many people are really behaving like that? I guess that's the comment I like to make. If I could offer a quick response. Um, I agree with the direction. Um, I'm slightly worried about one way of looking at the question is how can I bring the organization to the next level? Um, in fact, probably more it is how can the organization be brought to the next level? Um, uh, it is a single director, unless he happens to be a chief executive who's extraordinarily powerful, a single director cannot change the shape of an organization except negatively. Um, and and um, it, it, it is a challenge and an unmeetable challenge for anyone to try to, uh, to do so. The real trick here is exercising independent judgment at the same time as attempting to work with, that doesn't mean being a slave to, but to work with the management. You're not there on a day-to-day -day basis. Half-time job, yes, okay, often less. It's the management that is there at nine in the morning, that leaves at nine at, um, uh, uh, at night, that makes those operating decisions. It is the management that actually, in reality, sets strategies they will, raise, uh, they will raise options, they will have them discussed, they will drive the uh, creation of a consensus and strategy for the organization, and then the board's job is to help monitor the progress towards um, uh, achieving that, uh, that strategy. Independence will be tested when you're looking at priorities and strategies. Independence will be tested when you're looking at results as you move down the path towards uh, achieving strategies. But all of the work in between, it's the job of the management. The problem is that we tend not to scrutinize in a very intelligent way. Some people will just want to be forever the referee and declare people, uh, people offside. Then you will end up with a, with a dysfunctional boardroom and a, and, and a management which increasingly attempts to um, distance itself from, uh, uh, from a board because they regard the board as obstructive and because they're earning much more and their bonuses and other incentives are tied to the achievement of, um, uh, of goals, however perverse some of those incentives uh, might be. It is management which will then drive its own agenda for achieving those objectives and try to work around the board. That's when you, when you see that happening, that's when your board is dysfunctional. And it isn't necessarily always fair to blame management for this process. It means that the chairman, the senior independent director, as, uh, the second most important person there, is not in fact trying to get the board to work hand in hand with management and partnering with management without necessarily adopting the role of, um, uh, of management. Now, this sounds complicated, and believe me, it is. There's an awful lot of feel that goes into, um, uh, into doing this right. But if we, if we don't have that working, and then we don't have the other relationship working, which we're gonna talk about uh, later, which is the relationship with the shareholders, then you end up not just with a board that is dysfunctional and a relationship between board and management that it isn't working, you're going to end up with a very difficult relationship between, with the comp between the company and its shareholders, which in fact is also, it's a triangular relationship because management and board actually independently should be talking to, um, uh, to shareholders, but largely saying much the same thing. Um, one of our problems that I think we have here is that we do not write charters for our boards of directors. There are some, with, there, there are some very vague ones. I was very interested in looking at, um, uh, in the United Kingdom, when they, uh, the, the government took over a building society, the Bradford and Bingley Building Society, which was one of the uh, primary vehicles that collapsed and helped drag down the UK um, uh, banking sector. And when they sat down and tried to work out exactly what they did, they ended up writing a charter for the board of directors, which clearly described the responsibility of the executive, the responsibility of appointed directors, and the responsibility of, um, uh, of shareholders, so that, the, so that everyone knew the roles that they were meant to play. It's clearly stated in this charter that the, that the non-executive and, uh, and shareholder directors did not 
have the role to start to formulate strategy. They left it clearly as the role of, uh, of management to, um, uh, to formulate the strategy. Where did they interfere? Ah, making sure that Jamal wasn't paid too much or wasn't being rewarded for achieving short-term goals by getting long-term rewards, um, uh, uh, which um, you can see is happening uh, throughout uh, Europe and the United States now where, um, uh, where, where shareholders are actually even demanding a voice in terms of incentives. There the board had to interfere to make sure that, um, uh, that incentives for the executive, which is what they're working for in, um, in large part, um, incentives were in line with the achievement of long-term sustainable um, uh, uh, results. That's how the board can, um, uh, can play a role. And I think we need to be much more careful here about defining charters. This charter for the Bradford and Bingley is 19 pages long. Not 19 paragraphs, 19 pages long. It goes into the, uh, the job of all of the component contributors to the company in great detail. And I think it's an exercise probably that is worth sitting down and doing between directors and, um, and if possible, involving major institutional shareholders as, uh, uh, as well. How many of you sitting as directors actually have charters for the board of directors which is agreed with the company and is actually published and distributed to our shareholders isn't that a pity not one hand goes up in this room I think it's a, I think it's a shame in other words you don't have a game plan you don't you don't actually have the ground rules for um, uh, for the game that you're playing on the board of directors how can you do your job Huh? I think there's a challenge there. Right, anyone over here with a question? Tom? Yep. It's a practical question, really. Um, that situation you talked about where the board, of pa board papers arrive the night before is quite common, or even the day before or two days before, but it's a very difficult uh, process to get out of. So in the practical terms, how would you deal with that where you've, got to, you've asked for the papers early. Two weeks would be great, but how often that happens, I don't know. And, it's still, and they're still coming late. Uh, what would you do in that situation? Ask your managing director whether he thinks it's, uh, uh, whether he thinks it's um, appropriate to run the company by emergency. Okay. Because if he does think it's appropriate, he's not the right man to be the managing director. If we're running by emergency, we're not running our companies. We need, we're knee-jerk reacting to everything. The thing that I hate to hear is the paper is late because we had to seize a window of opportunity. Did you not realize that this window of opportunity was, uh, was coming? Most things do not happen overnight. Most things happen as in, in uh, they develop over a period of time. Why was the board not briefed much earlier on the developing issue so that it was prepared to understand a situation? Why is it that a decision has to be made inside of 24 hours? I can only think of one reason. Remove the ability to debate it. Yeah? Yeah. And, that is, and as soon as you see that you're, you're, someone is trying to handcuff you into, into a decision by not allowing enough time to discuss it, refuse to discuss it. Refuse to let it be on the, um, uh, on the agenda. And when you see it happening, more than once, in, uh, uh, once or twice a year, go to your chairman and you tell your chairman, sir, you need to exercise more discipline. We as a board are very unhappy with the way things are going. How often do the independent directors sit down and converse amongst themselves? How often do you have scheduled into your board meetings a little in-camera time? For the, um, uh, uh, for the independent uh, uh, directors to, uh, uh, to meet, for the non-executive directors to meet as a body without, mani without the, the executive directors involved. Actually, if you do it once, you'll scare the living daylights out of the uh, chief executive because he'll think you're talking about him behind his back, which is probably true, and then he'll wonder whether you're trying to fire him. Okay, very unfair. But if you actually schedule this as part of a standard board meeting day, a meeting prior and at a meeting at, um, uh, at the end or halfway through the, um, uh, uh, through the session for an in-camera um, uh, 15 minutes, 
And if there's nothing to discuss, you go back on. It means that it becomes a routine. And it's a way where, the, where the, certainly the independents can discuss amongst themselves. The idea of working from start to finish through, through um, a, a formal agenda, in fact, is also a, pressure, a way of pressurizing decisions. You feel we've got to get through all 15 items, okay? And as soon as you, uh, as soon as you do that, what happens? Then there's another one that comes in. It's called the bicycle shed syndrome. Yeah. Have you ever come across that one? Item, um, uh, item three on the agenda. You've had your accounts and the, and the minutes and all the rest of it. Item three on the agenda. Let's spend five billion and build a nuclear reactor, okay? Item four on the agenda. Let's spend 500 um, uh, ringgit and change the color of the paint on the bicycle shed that the workers, that the workers park their motorbikes under, okay? Which one will take the longest to debate? The bicycle shed. <laughs> None of us have got any opinion on a nuclear power plant. <laughs> sure, we leave it to the technicians. If all the technical experts say it's a good idea, that'll get voted through. Total discussion time, 10 minutes. Bicycle shed, everyone's got an opinion on the color, where the bicycle shed should be. And oh, by the way, I've got a friend who can do it cheaper than that. <laughs> huh? And the bicycle shed will take 30 or 40 minutes to discuss. Which is the most important issue? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Now, when like you pressurize agendas, you, um, you end with this sort of thing happening. Yeah. Go on. Just one small thing. Uh, we also call it thin file syndrome. Thin file syndrome means when you do not allow the directors to know more and more. Thin file syndrome means when the agenda is there proper, it's with minimum, minimum required papers. So the file is extremely thin. So if the file is thin, you have less, very little uh, or restricted information. And unless you are very aware or unless you are very, uh, uh, what you call, persistent or uh, vocal, you will not ask for more and more information. Or, so they will give you the minimum possible information. And that's what exactly he said when it is 5 billion uh, decision for a nuclear power plant, the file is extremely thin, but when it, is, it comes to uh, 5,000, uh, cycle shed, the file is extremely thick. All sort of papers, all sort of documents, analysis, this and that, everything is there which you can understand. But that uh, 5 billion distance you can't understand, so the file is extremely thin. And that is uh, also, that has been experienced by some of the directors uh, which I have come to know. If, if, if I can, uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Rosman and uh, the members, also the question. Um, one of the key uh, things that, that is useful for a director to have, uh, which, which doesn't happen uh, very often, is, is, is this strategy session. I, I find that um, once a year, we will allocate one to one and a half days on an off-site basis uh, 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 for the board where we will discuss about strategy. Um, what is the vision of the company and how are we going to execute the vision? How are we going to uh, do the budgets and what, what do we aim to achieve? It, it's not about numbers, it's about strategy. And uh, for example, um, you see in banking, let's say for example, um, the central bank uh, coming down hard on consumer banking and you know that uh, things are going to slow down in consumer banking. What do you do about it? Uh, how are you going to get out and go into another strategy of maybe expansion in an international market? Now, that doesn't get talked about in the normal monthly or quarterly agenda of a board. And, and this is what you should be practicing uh, as a board, or you should be demanding from your company that at every year you should set aside and pick the brains of management and actually understand where they're coming from. And, and we do this as a session where, uh, you know, we present the vision and then from, from all departments right up to 
business to to uh, risk management and and compliance and all that they present what they think about the moving forward and then what is more important which is becoming a big tool today especially in financial institutions is is what we call the risk appetite statement this risk appetite statement is basically um, a, a, a set of statements that actually says what is it that we want to do and what is it that we can um, swallow in terms of risk uh, well if you want a high ROE oh, your risk is going to be higher and therefore you can allow management to for example do risky things like uh, trading and uh, derivatives and and, uh, um, and and basically investment banking as, as, as areas where uh, that but if your risk appetite is lower then uh, you would not be doing these things and for there to be an agreed risk appetite statement you actually then can control and say when management presents a budget which gives a, a profit increase of 15 percent when you question and say no I want 30 percent then the best record is the risk appetite statement and you go back to the risk appetite and say for this 30 percent sir I have to do um, I have to give limits high limits to my FX trader to get this profits are you willing to do that so these are the debates that never get talked about in a normal monthly board meeting and these are the important things because you then understand where the vision of uh, of the organization is going to and and there that charts whatever happens in for the rest of the year and and I see this not happening in a lot of organizations and and um, uh, if we have that I think it would make our jobs a lot easier because uh, the tables and the cards are laid before us it's not about figures it's about strategy so that's that's how you should be looking at and you should be questioning things thanks it's not about figures it's about strategy well, it's, it, it's interesting how many of you don't work in banks how many non bankers are there here huge number uh, now I feel more at home okay when was the last time any of you had a board meeting away from head office had and going to have again do you find it beneficial yeah I think one of the things for for banks it's a bit difficult but the branches more or less look the look the, um, uh, look the same and and banking is an intellectual exercise um, running a factory is not an intellectual exercise necessarily um, fabricating things certainly is not building things is certainly is not and really understanding strategy means understanding how you get the job really done which means getting it done in the in the yard getting it done on the ground getting it on the work site um, and it's very often um, I, I find that directors become detached from the reality of the workplace they go to the head office they get fed nice lunches they um, uh, uh, they endure, enjoy a day um, and then and maybe maybe they meet one or two other members of senior management over the board lunch but they don't, don't don't go and talk to the chairman they don't go and talk to a welder they don't go and talk to an electrician I tell you what if you're building ships your engineers don't build the ships your directors don't build the ships it's the guy with a welding torch in his hand that builds the ship it's the guy who lays uh, cables and pipes and does things like that and if our directors are not in touch with that they don't have a fundamental understanding of the um, uh, of the business and most of it isn't rocket science I hear a lot of talk about you know you need to be um, uh, wise about the industry yes and you can do some of that intellectually but to know what it really feels like you need to get hot and sweaty and get in the yard so why don't we have the odd board meeting out in the um, uh, in a yard maybe in an air-conditioned office but at least in a yard where we can see how the real people are doing the real work it's a great way of enhancing your ability to be independent you bring your mind there 
Now you open, now you open your mind. You will ask questions that the guys who work there all the time won't ask. Why is it like that? I was in a, I was in a shipyard in, um, uh, in, um, in, in Penang um, about three weeks ago, and they were complaining about how the water kept flooding into one of the sheds. I asked them, why is the water comes down which way? It comes down the hillside. So I said, well, so why is the level of the ground at the back of the shed higher than the floor of the shed? Oh. I said, yeah, isn't that the natural way that the water flows in? They had just sat there and watched it for years and years and years and just got so used to it, no one questioned it. Dig two drains, not one, capture the water, get it flowing away, and oh, by the way, lower the ground further back so that you can capture even more and divert the flows. It didn't take much, but it took someone who just hadn't sat there for years to ask the dumb question and then to get the right answer out of it. Um, I'm an executive director. Do you know one of the greatest, my, the, 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 the greatest um, uh, tools that I have is actually to ask the independent question. Huh? In fact, as an executive director, I have to be independent of much of the rest of management because I have to ask them the questions they're not asking themselves. All right? If you, if you see me doing that, then you understand how as an, as an independent director, you must ask the executive the questions that they're not asking themselves. And you know what? If they can't answer to your satisfaction, maybe they don't know the answer. Right? That's one of, your, um, uh, one of the tools. Any more from the floor? Anything from this side? Yeah, may please. I just want to, uh, I think between the comment and the question and the presentation, I want to, uh, and, and what you've just said, I want to uh, add that we have a problem in this room. If, if everybody in this room intend to be a director and have not asked questions except for more than one, we have an issue. You've just said you have to ask the questions. <laughs> um, in terms of the selection criteria of, of the different people that you might have on your board, I think uh, you know, the, the difficulty is when you listen to the presentation earlier, Dato has said, if you remember, that you're not going to get paid a lot. It's, it's not a role you take on to make money. It has to be something you want to do. But then again, there are people all over the country, all over the world, who would love to do the job just for the sake of being a director, right? Or for the, yeah, it's a self-fulfilling uh, thing that uh, you had mentioned earlier. So, the, I guess if, if I can add all of those together, or all of these comments, is that if, if you were truly looking for an independent director, or if you truly want to be one, you have to exhibit the character, the characteristic. You have to be charitable, for example, where you know, you know, I have a friend who often tells me that, you know, Jamal, you're sitting here at this uh, Tetarek table, you know, and that lady came and you gave her ringgit. Why? I said, because I have 10 ringgit. So it's 10%, right? Now he asked me, if you happen to have a million ringgit in your pocket, would you give her 100,000? It's still 10%. But now the magnitude is different. So this is, this, this, uh, uh, you know, this is an example of a characteristic you're exhibiting. It suddenly changes you. Situation changes you. But then it also shows you're not consistent, right? Um, and I think that, uh, that if you can live life in, in a consistent way that exhibits characteristics naturally, maybe because of your upbringing, uh, we discussed that at the lunch table how mothers play a key role in bringing in the future, bringing up of uh, future directors, independent especially. Uh, I think that we need to keep an eye open on that. And uh, last but not least, you have a choice, right? If, if you are asked by shareholders or by anyone to be an independent director, it is still your choice. You don't have to say yes. You might want to, but you may have to say no. And based on that question, that last question, if you see a company that is managing by emergencies, you know, you have to make a decision, right? But if you do decide to go in, then it's a different question altogether. It may not be that you have to change the CEO or the managing director or the top management. It may be that they are unaware there are systems and processes needs to be improved so that no last minute five million pound or five million ringgit nuclear power stations 
<laughs> you know, get sent to your house or your email the night before the meeting. But ultimately, I think if you add a lot of these comments today, uh, the, uh, the answer is not obvious, but uh, we, we are getting there. I think we're getting there. There is time for at least one or two more questions. So, can we bully? Can we bully somebody to um, ask you a question? Have you got an issue that really disturbs? Uh, okay. One question. Okay, Jamma, thank you for. That. Okay, uh, uh, Rosalie from uh, uh, Petrans Gas, uh, Brahat, and also. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm a little bit privileged. I'm sit in the in the board of the directors of Petra Gas and also a CEO of uh, uh, Malaysian Thailand Joint Authority. So I can understand this pressure of submitting papers two weeks before the meetings because I'm uh, sitting on both ends. But uh, I guess the technology now is so, everything goes so fast and uh, with the technology that we have, a lot of our business decisions uh, cannot be uh, happen uh, in, in, in a few days, a lot of decisions are, are, are being done at a, at a supersonic speed, you know, nowadays. So sometimes it's not possible to prepare papers for deliberation two weeks or three weeks. My, my board members uh, I, I know, uh, ask me, I want a paper two months, one month before the meeting. If not, we won't consider. But again, there's a, I have to say that in reality, there could be opportunity loss if you don't do that. So it's nice to have paper on uh, early, but I guess to overcome this, the board it must be a part of the of the of the company. That means uh, the board must be aware of what's going on in the company. There are if 70, 80 percent of the paper come in early, two weeks in advance, but one or two that have to come in late. But the board must understand that this is necess necessary because uh, it is an opportunity for the company. And the management also must also uh, uh, be uh, proactive in advising the board that there's one or two that is coming late because it is important. Then I think it would be a very, uh, a very good uh, relationship between the board and the management. But if you put a straight, a straight line a straight cut off line, I think you'll be detached. The board and the management will be detached and, and it's very uh, difficult top of war kind of game, you know. So I think Jamal, that's uh, one uh, uh, opinion from me. Okay, thanks. Thank you, uh, Dato. So I, I, I knew that was going to come up because we are both in the oil and gas industry and sometimes we make highly risky, high value decisions that really should have gone to the board. But uh, some boards, they say, if it's not two weeks before, we're not going to talk about it. Knowing that it's not going to happen, what are you going to do? You're going to miss an opportunity. And you, you've now risked management of a company taking a key decision, high risk, high value, without going through the board. So I guess what, what uh, Dato's comment is good is that you have to have a balance. You have to have a compromise sometimes. But you're not, you're not, you know, you're going to make sure that the board is not manipulated by the by the management either. Uh, or Barclays Bank and manipulates or Barclays the Bank, money exactly. markets and, um, and and so on. I think the I think the fact is um, uh, the company works 365 days a year. If the board sits four days a year, it doesn't mean that the company isn't working in between times, and that the the balance is there. Um, Making sure that the board is kept informed with progress reports in between board meetings. Why can't there be a monthly newsletter? Why can't there be warm-up papers? Many situations where you make an urgent decision have probably developed over a period of, of, of days and weeks in advance of you having to make the decision. So why does management feel that they have to get the decision at the last minute rather than um, uh, keep the board informed? What the board needs to do is to encourage the information flow, um, uh, to break the barrier that management thinks, no, we only inform the board once every quarter. 
and to, uh, and, and to uh, make sure that progress reports are flowing and it will encourage greater dialogue. It will actually, if you do it right, shorten the board meeting because all of the preliminary stuff will be well understood. So I, I, you know, I urge uh, uh, management and boards to encourage flows of information papers. Uh, uh, it would just make the overall management of the company that much easier if you do it. Uh, just to add one small thing, if the decision is strategic, which is going to um, affect the long-term health of the organization and also the risk involved in that, certainly those decisions can't be taken. Uh, I totally agree, some of the decisions, minor label, it's not having long-term impact, maybe high risk, high value, okay, you take. But those decisions which are going to uh, determine the direction of the organization can't be taken in 15 days time or one month time. It is certainly gradual. So if it is gradual, then why board of directors were given the papers one week before or 10 days before or five, two days before the meeting? Those decisions must be uh, based on in flow of information which was passed to them long back so that they can evaluate. They, if they have queries, they can raise. May, of course, there is always you have to keep a balance. What is most urgent and what is strategic? If it is strategic and high risk, which may uh, decide the entire future of the company, then board must be uh, informed well in advance rather than making urgent decisions. For example, uh, there is one very important uh, situation happened in um, Satyam. Satyam, you all know very well, Satyam Computer was one of the biggest uh, uh, companies in India and how it went down. And number of decisions pertaining to investment in other subsidiaries, which was nothing, which was away from the core business of the company, was taken by the board of directors with a paper which was sent to them just two days before the meeting. So the, the, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize those type of decisions. Yes, of course, when you're running the business very correctly, Barry, Mr. Berry said that company runs for 365 days, whereas board sits only four days or five days in a year. So we have to seek a balance between the two and you are a better judge person to determine why, whether it was really necessary or urgent or it could have been given to you much earlier than at what time it has been given to you. That's what my point. I, I, yeah, I want to put a friend on the spot, Cam. Yeah. What is the single most onerous uh, task that you have as a, an independent director, what is the, th the one thing you dread having to do? So far, I think, I mean, as you said, an honorous question, but uh, I, think, I think maybe I'm fortunate. The organization I'm with, the FI, is very well structured. Mm -hmm. Policies are in place, charters are in place, committees are in place, and we have a matrix. So meaning, and we also, I think I mentioned earlier, we have also off-camera discussion. Uh, we also have, uh, as uh, Dr. Reza mentioned, you know, uh, off-site strategy meetings as well. And I think also, I think because the organization is well-oiled, uh, but nevertheless, because the board members are, I think, uh, in, in, this, in this aspect, they're all individual people, and they come from... Uh, from, from the industry, mm -hmm. from a regulator. I come from a very diverse background. Uh, I've been there, I've been uh, on all sides. So I think the, the question is for me being onerous so far, none. Because we deliberate. So when you deliberate, there's nothing onerous. Mm. So if we have to disagree or we disagree, if that dissent, there's also been dissent. And I think, and, and we call it as such. Yeah. Do you ever have conversations with your fellow directors outside of board meetings, weeks, uh, out, you know? Oh, yeah, we do, we do, sometimes. So you're, you're actually in communication with yeah, each yeah, other? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. We communicate, we have an open line, yeah. and I think the, the whole idea is not to find fault on anything. Yeah. It's so that we understand yeah. the subject matter. Yeah. Not coming from industry, and I agree with uh, Prabhat saying, sometimes it's difficult to understand. So sometimes you need to understand, then you have to discuss off camera, yeah. before the meeting yeah. and learn from somebody who understands yeah. rather than go to the meeting blind. Uh, this is why, th th thanks to you and FIDE. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we have the tools. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I think there are a couple of things here. One, it, it, it's clear the job isn't a five-day-a-year job. Yeah. It's actually a 365-day-a-year job where, where for long periods you're not active, but you must be willing to be active. Yeah. But I think uh, the important thing is that, that you've said you keep talking with your colleagues on the board outside of board meetings. And that's a way of making sure yeah. that um, you're sharing information and opinion amongst yeah. yourselves so that you are actually better informed and it will, will make your board meetings work okay. far, better, far better. Okay, my, my wearing another hat, I mean, that's on the FIs, but like Jamal and uh, MTJA, my bread and butter is oil and gas. I'm with JL Noble Denton. So, as you said also, sometimes there are decisions you have to make. But fortunately, my partners are also board members, so we interact literally every day. So that's slightly different uh, uh, as compared, because we're not a PLC or listed. But the interaction is on a daily basis, so it's a different, different decision process. Yeah? I just want to wrap up with one comment, and that is that I mean, this all comes under the umbrella of corporate governance. Corporate governance is not about a set of rules. It's about developing a process which really works. You know, we, can, we can get bogged down with rules and regulations and describe perfect ways of doing things. But perfect ways to, for perfect ways to work, you need perfect situations, and there are very few of those. Um, the reality is, can you make it work, and can you make it work um, uh, uh, effectively? It's very interesting. There's a, there's a lot of um, a dialogue in the United States uh, uh, with, um, uh, with, with various interest groups wanting to get involved in, um, uh, you know, at shareholder level and so on, and others talking with, um, uh, uh, talking with uh, directors. And one of the key things is separating the role of the chairman and the chief executive. It's one of the big themes um, uh, of this day and age. Okay. Very interestingly, in over 25% of the engagement exercises organized by the, uh, basically it's an institute of senior independent or lead directors in the United States. In over 25% of the engagements where they have held a discussion with a, a, a gentleman who was both chief executive and chairman of the board, they have at the end of that meeting concluded that in these circumstances, it was the best and most effective way of running that particular company. And that is something that I urge a lot of the, the, uh, the regulators to think about. There is no such thing as one size fits all when it comes to, uh, to corporate governance. As there is no one thing that uh, one size that fits all about what it takes to be a really good independent director other than knowing in your heart that you're doing the right thing. Thanks everybody, I think we'll break for tea now. Thank you Mr. Barry. Thank you very much uh, our fellow peer panelists for today for those uh, informative thoughts, ideas sharing, case studies on the topic that has been discussed specifically just now on the independent directors, the rise of the guardians. So as a sign of gratitude, we would like to invite Mr. Barry to present a token of appreciation to uh, two of our panelists, which is Mr. Jamal Ainu, the chairman of Slambaja Malaysia, and as well, Yang Berbahagia Datuk Haji Muhammad Reza Shah Abdul Wahid, the CEO of Bank Muamalat Malaysia Berhad. Now, Ms. Julie, uh, on behalf of Asian World Summit, will present a small token of appreciation from us to you, Mr. Barry. <laughs>